I'm not used to speaking in a microphone in front of a bunch of people. Uh, so, I, I went to Agape back in 2006 for the second time. I stayed there until I graduated in 2009. I was 17. I didn't have a home to go home to. Uh, like many of us that went to Agape or, or Circle of Hope or some of these, these uh, schools, some of us deserve to be in a, in a place because we had our own issues as teenagers, right? Uh, I'm not really going to get into some of mine, but I definitely needed to be in a place where I could get some help. Uh, the help I got, though, was not the help I needed. Uh, yep. I didn't need to get beat up and abused from staff members on a daily basis. Uh, I didn't feel like I didn't need to to watch kids try to commit suicide and then in the process get restrained and beat up afterwards. Um, I tried to start a riot at Agape because of the abuse that we were enduring. And it was a day in and a day out thing that happened on a daily basis. Uh, and it, man, it makes me so mad because Agape looks so amazing, it's so beautiful. Uh, they're a pillar of the community here in Stockton, right? And, and, and the doors are mag locked for a reason so that they can't come in and we can't get out. So no one sees what goes on behind the closed doors. Same as Circle of Hope, right? Because I know Householder, he was a staff member there when I was. And some of the things he did to us, I feel so bad for you ladies, because I know it's true. Uh, and then you've got other schools running around here. You've got Masters Ranch in, Cra in Couch, Missouri. You've got Legacy Boys Academy right down the road. Both of those schools are all former Agape staff members. Legacy Ranch, that guy that runs that school, he used to abuse us, he used to beat us. He, uh, I was 17, he choked me out. So they're running rapid here. So I'd like to, that's kind of why I'm talking. Another reason why I'm talking is I'm here for the voices that can't be spoken to. We've had kids from Agape kill themselves based on some of the abuse they endured there from the 90s, the 2000s, up until present day. I'm here to talk to them. I'm here to talk to the girls that can't speak to them for, uh, for themselves. Also for the kids that are still in these schools right now. Uh, I think Agape's yeah. got 150 students in there. Thank God Circle of Hope is shut down. Ain't nobody in that one. Yeah. Uh, thank God for Amanda, because if she didn't yeah. say something. So, we're one down, a few more to go, but we can do it. Uh, and if we can't shut them down, then we need laws to change. We need laws in this town right here and in this state to change. We need some laws out there. I know the legislators, I wish they could be here, but they're listening to us uh, thanks to the Kansas City Star. Uh, Judy has uh, been amazing. I wish I could, there's so much I wish I could do for her. But they're listening. They held a committee last week and uh, yeah. I listened to the whole thing. I got in trouble. I was at work listening to it. <laughs> you know I got to take some hours. Uh, my bad, y'all. Uh, but I did. I listened to it and they touched on the abuse that was going on in these schools. They touched on uh, not being able to come in there because they're not regulated. So, uh, I'm hoping that all changes. Uh, at the very least, if we can't close them down, we need to get them licensed, but we need to get them regulated. Background right. checks. Yes. Yes. We need the government to be able to walk in there and say, oh, no, I'm gonna do a health inspection right now. I'm gonna walk through these hallways and see if this building's clean. Uh, I'm gonna walk through here and if I, I'm gonna see if I got kids with rug burns on their face, or I'm gonna ask why there's a hole in this wall the size of a body. Uh, I need to, we need to be able to do that. And then not only that, we need to get the boys in these schools and the girls in these schools a voice to reach out to them while they're in there. Yes. Uh, I was there for a total of five and a half years and I never one time saw a police officer or a CPS agent come to that school. I had to run away from Agape for them to come to me. Um, we can do better. We, can. we, we can do better. better. We, can, we can do better, but we need to do better. Uh, I flew from New Mexico to come out here. I don't like this town. I don't even like <laughs> Missouri because of what I had to go through here. Yeah! I fucking hate it. And it makes me so mad that I have to come here because 12 years later, it's still going on. I listened to a podcast from a kid from Agape like two months ago. He's still getting beat up by Brian Clemson. All these staff, you want to talk about a person. Brian Clemson needs to be put in prison. That yes! Boyd Householder needs yes. to he beat yes. the girls up. Ron Sheldon needs to be in prison. Yes! yes. Whoa! Be in prison. And the staff members that watched it happen, you need to be held accountable. Yeah. Because you're just as guilty. Yeah. Yes. We're living people. We're the ones that are speaking now. And I hope to God we hold you accountable. These Missouri State legislators, 
They're going to hold you accountable one day. And if you believe the Christian faith like you say, God's going to hold you accountable for the way you treat us. Yes. Right? And there's one thing that I can say. We're not kids anymore. And with social media, we have a huge voice. And we're yes. going to use it. And if you ain't listening, you better start listening. Because we're here. We ain't we're going here. nowhere. Woo! Hi, this is Janine Miller, and you are watching Pieces of Victory. Today, we have on our show, Robert Buckler. Robert is a survivor of a lockdown residential program called Agape Boarding School. This boarding school is located today in Missouri, abusing boys. In spite of allegations of child neglect, medical neglect, child endangerment, beating the boys, starvation, rape allegations, rape allegations, and yet the school is still running. Robert is here today to bravely tell his story. He is well-respected amongst the survival community. He is part of Unsilenced. He is also a part of We Warn Them, and he's making a difference regarding legislation with Missouri lawmakers. Please welcome to the show, Robert Buckley. The staff do, you have about, you know, the staff at Agape boarding school are huge. They're, I mean, obsessively overweight, uh, most of them. And, you know, I, I think, you know, I was like a buck 20 um, when I went there. Like, I didn't weigh much at all. Um, and you have three to four staff members, uh, you know, one on your legs, one on each arm, one on your neck, um, just holding you down, like tw twisting, twisting your arms, twisting your legs, punching you, kicking you, uh, you know, for hours. And you're just it's screaming. Not just holding someone down. You're they're twisting the children's limbs. Yes. Yeah. Being and applying pressure to the pressure points as well. Um, you know, it's it's disgusting, honestly. Um, you know, nothing would happen. They, nothing, like, I, I was sexually abused there by an older student, and nothing happened. I reported it. My family was never notified. Um, it, it's just mind-blowing. Yeah, that. Me again, finally, another staff member. There's four of them out there. Just grabbed me and slammed me into the wall and into the tile. Uh, actually, I think it was concrete before they tiled it. But anyways, he was laying, He put his knee on the back of my head and uh, and, like upper shoulders and uh, brought, uh the director was like go get jesse so staff member walks in goes to get jesse and uh as soon as he walks out there he doesn't even get asked the question the director punches him right in the face big i mean gives him a big black eye oh and, uh, he, yeah i mean he essentially just beat all three of us up gives him a big black eye they slam him to the ground and that director proceeded to like it was like a pinball machine, go back and forth between ro rolling me and Jesse, kicking us in the ribs, kicking us in the arms, uh, calling us names, telling us like you know we're pieces of, <laughs> calling us terrorists for trying to beat up staff members in a in a Christian organization. How we should be thrown in prison because you know the world doesn't uh, we don't deserve to be in a world of uh, freedom, all kinds of stuff. And then uh, after about five, maybe ten minutes of that, uh, and of course the whole time we have staff members on the back of us mashing our face into the into the tile or concrete whichever was there uh then he says get up take your clothes off so we take our clothes off he says take everything but your boxers or your underwear strip down that's what you're gonna wear from here on out a few months later we had a kid attempt to hang himself in the bunk beds tied his shoelaces in a bathrobe around his neck knowing that in the morning when he didn't get out of bed staff members gonna walk through and dump his mattress causing him to hang and that's exactly what happened i watched that man hang uh and instead of getting him counseling he was restrained for it. He never saw medical help or anything. Um, I can go on and on for st stories like this. Uh, go do physical workouts until they puke. They may even be getting restrained as we speak. And restraints are not like your uh, CPS department lines it out to be. The restraints that got me boarding school result in kids getting picked up over the head and slammed into walls. I've seen kids put through walls. I've been put through a wall. Uh, kids get slammed on tile, concrete, and asphalt. Um, so I'm here to ask for your support in this bill and to help save kids in our country. I mean, starting in Missouri and maybe later on we can do something nationwide. But uh, thank you for hearing me and thank you for allowing me to be here. Appreciate it. So one of the really big staff members, he, he grabbed me and he put me on my stomach 
and uh, he sat on top of my back. He put his hand on the back of my head, and he uh, curled his fingers around my head, and he picked my head up, and he smashed my face into the floor. And so then there was blood and snot all over the floor. I peed myself, and I was holding my head up out of the blood and snot, and I was begging him to to not hurt me again. I was basically saying, like, please don't smash my face into a floor again. Please don't hurt me again. Please don't do it again. And he said, stop. And I said, stop what? And he said, stop talking. So I think that he was saying, like, he was trying to get me to stop talking, like, because I was saying stuff about him smashing my face. Like, he didn't want the other students in the other hallway to hear me, I guess. But, uh, anyway. So I stopped talking, and he puts his hand on the top of my head, and he turns my head to the side, and he pushes my head down to where the side of my face is is laying in the pool of snot and blood and also when i when my face hit the ground my my teeth got hit i think the only reason i didn't lose teeth is because my, i had braces but my braces were really messed up and they took a really long time to take me to the doctor this was a, a guy okay. yeah okay. and so uh very mentally controlling like that uh agape was a little better education but uh, a lot of, I mean, same same thing with work crews. Uh, discipline was very high. No talking, no social interaction whatsoever, um, unmonitored. So you were at Agape boarding school from looks like ninety nine to mm-hmm. two thousand one. And but they keep preaching about how they cared about us and and, and as the students. But then I, you know, like I think my mom didn't pay for or forgot or something happened. Whether she just chose not to pay, I don't know. But for a few months they had not paid, and they were coming to me to call my mom to tell her to pay and but preaching to us that they're not in it for the money yeah and that was my kind of thing that started me turning on like a god i mean i was already frustrated with not you know not seeing your family not having birthday parties not having christmases or thanksgivings at home those things were really emotionally tolling so that part of it was and then not being able to have actual social or any aspect of outside world like no tv no newspapers no music no nothing uh, but once the money aspect came of it, I was like, these guys are hypocrites. They don't care about us. They don't care about anything. It's money. It's money for them. Because you think about it, like we didn't, we didn't have no freedom, no rights. We had to do what we were told, uh, which as a kid, you should do what you're told anyways, right? But yeah. you should be allowed to free think. Sure. And have an opinion, even if it's doesn't matter. You should still have one. We were we were locked in magnetic door locks, you know. So like, you couldn't go anywhere, couldn't do anything. If you questioned it, you either got some type of punishment, or it was they didn't like it. They just decided they were going to hit me up all the time. So it pretty much was a sentence, right? Uh, pretty much. You know, they would bring yeah. I mean, they would bring inmates in. Uh, not all the time, but I think two times this happened. They brought inmates in. In a prison in Missouri, up up kind of closer by like uh, St. Louis, and those guys, you know, had more freedom than we did, and they were convicted. <laughs> Free labor. Oh. He needed a project done. He had 175 students to go pick from. Yep, you didn't have to hire a contractor. You just get the kids yeah. out there to do it. Yep, they were captains or red shirts. Had had a red shirt, uh, and then I guess my buddy, I didn't make it out the door. Brian grabbed me and slammed me, so that was the first time. So that, I mean, I was 12, real small. After that, they restrained me or got control of me and made sure I wasn't going to do that again. So I didn't really have any issues the first time. I watched it happen all the time. I mean, the older boys, they, man, they would mouth off, boom, get elbowed right in the face or slammed or, you know, it wasn't just him. It was several staff members would do this. Right. And they would encourage students to do it so the staff didn't have to get involved. Or we would go into what they called like a staff culture, which is like, maximum security prison you just can't lock us in a cell because you don't have them right yep uh so that you know they go ahead i'm gonna say so they, they encourage the students to try to step in first so we didn't have to deal with it and uh so we did so students did step in a lot of times and of course, second time though man good and they're, they're not liable either i mean they'll just watch it and no yeah teenagers you know. yeah teenagers they'll get a slap on the wrist you know i was on no talking for like Nine months mm. uh, before he left, which I'm sure you've heard about. No talking. It's, it's oh yeah. All of us uh, stare at your Bible, can't look around. You know. Yeah. When when was the time 
that you first like or maybe the first incident where you were like this is not just a you know a place where they're trying to help people there's something else here that's like not as positive and you know maybe is a negative place um i would say agape um but that was because um when we got to agape i was 11 and um when we toured the property they had this like room that was um right next to the um staff bathrooms and um actually the which is weird the female bathroom connected to this room so like we could go into this room but this room was all padded and carpeted or not padded it was just carpeted so it had like the cheapest carpet you could think of on it um and i remember um boys going up there and then coming back and they were um bloody it wasn't just like bruises they were like bloody um but we knew that as girls we weren't supposed to be looking at the boys so like it wasn't something you could like stare at or like get involved in we are here at agape and someone is actually backing up because they don't want to deal with us he's literally backing up so we know there's staff trying to get into the school but here we are right here we have to get those kids out do you want to say something um Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. Okay. We hope that um, Elvin's friend gets taken out as soon as possible. Yeah, and we're really concerned about his safety. They called it restraint, which was just being taken to the ground and then like manipulating pressure points. If I wouldn't go to church, they would restrain me. If I refused to go to work, they would throw me to the ground and just uh, restrain me. They would talk about how they knew that it hurt a whole lot and how they were really good at making it hurt. They would have three to five people holding me down and they would hold me down so long that they would have to like change staff members. I was scared to death, honestly. Like I was fearing for my life. I didn't know what was going on. Their purpose of restraint was about power and control. They were trying to cause pain in order to get compliance. Some faith-based schools in Missouri routinely use physical restraint as a form of punishment. A nearly 40-year-old law exempts boarding schools operated by any well-known religious order or church from licensure or oversight. Missouri is just one of two states that have no requirements for boarding schools to operate. Alan Knoll was 13 when he arrived at Agape Boarding School in 1999 and 15 when he left. He experienced various forms of punishment while at Agape, but during his last few months, he said he had had enough and refused to comply with the rules. He said that's when the almost daily, six to eight hour long restraint began. It is so painful um, because you're talking full on adults are holding you down, twisting your arms, twisting your legs. And I'm a child at Agape. I am 115 pounds, something like that. And I'm being held down by 200 to 250 pound adults and three, four, five of them. They're twisting your hands, they're bending your fingers, they're twisting your arms, your elbow hurts, your ankle, you know. I think I still um, today suffer from some of the consequences of those restraints that I went through at Agape. I was sent there for just being kind of depressed and angry and kind of violent at times, honestly. And then I turned like suicidal and my parents just didn't know what to do. It was Labor Day 2017 when 15 year old Gabe Miller arrived at Agape. On that first day, the school tried to shave his head. Gabe didn't want this, so he tried to grab the electric razor. He said they immediately threw him down and pinned him. Gabe describes how they used pressure points and force to restrain him for three to four hours. Yeah, so there was one right around in this area of your arm and they would put elbows and knees into that and just like full body force. And they would have one full grown man on each arm. And then there were like spots in your neck that they would like manipulate to. And they'd like force your head down onto the padded like floor of that room. Because of the law, Missouri has no records on unlicensed boarding schools. 
The state doesn't know their names, where they are, how many there are, or how many students they house. That lack of oversight has appealed to operators from other states hoping to escape government scrutiny. Southern Missouri, in particular, is becoming a mecca of sorts. The Star has found at least 13 unlicensed Christian boarding schools that have operated in seven southern counties. And they feel that their homes will collapse, that they can't instill discipline. There was really no reason for four men to be on me. At that point, it was no longer restraint. It was abuse or just physical attacks, I would say. Even if reports of abuse are substantiated, Missouri has no authority over a school's operations. The religious exemptions exist because we have weak-kneed politicians that won't stand up for children's rights. We have politicians that are more concerned about angering their religious constituents than protecting children. I am a Christian now, and I was a Christian before I went to Agape, and I can firmly say that I think they should be regulated and that Jesus is not an excuse for doing what they do to kids and beating them emotionally, physically, spiritually. Uh, these children deserve um, politicians and legislators and law enforcement that will take a stand and get rid of these loopholes, period. Southwest Missouri boarding school is facing nine new lawsuits from former students alleging they were abused at the school. The lawsuits against Agape Boarding School in Stockton were filed by former students who attended this school from March of 2015 to June of 2019. They accuse other students and staff of abuse, battery, and in some cases, starving and torturing students. Five staff members at Agape face charges of assaulting students. 14 former students have now sued Agape since February of 2021. I'm Lester Holt. Tonight on Dateline, a secret too long in the shadows. One woman's courageous fight to bring it to light. My parents were supposed to help these kids. You would expect this to be a good Christian place. No parent would have sent their child there knowing what happened. What was it like in there? It was hell. I was sexually abused. There? Yes, sir. I felt like I was nothing. There were numerous concerns about abuse going on at this facility. My dad would pick a girl up by her neck, throw her to the ground. He would trip you and shove you. Knock her out. Yes, sir. I mean it. I just posted it to TikTok. Knock her out. It just blew up. These allegations need to be looked into. How could I do this to my child? Thinking I was helping her. Your parents deny everything. And they said none of that stuff is true. What was going on was wrong. Something needed to be done. I just needed her to have help. Behind closed doors, they were monsters. It was my pastor and his wife that told us about Circle of Hope. You know, I was like, okay, this is a really good place. I'm actually going to get help here. Was your dad well suited to this kind of uh, work? It was second nature to him to just put people in their place. What was it like in there? It was hell. You were alone. It was basically, while you're in there, it's survival. It was like dog eat dog. If you don't fight your way to the top, it's gonna come back at you. I want Mac Ford to spend the rest of his life in prison. I want him to admit the things that he did to all of us. I need to know if something happens, 
you guys are going to continue this on. If I can't go to trial, you guys are going to continue and stand on my behalf. I had to go to the bathroom so bad. So instead of waiting for them, I went and bypassed them and asked Brother Mac. Oh my God. Oh my God. I asked him to take me to the bathroom. He had never touched me before. You filthy little whore. I can't believe you're doing this to me. I can't believe you're making me do this. As he was unbuttoning his, his pants, I could hear everybody in the church still in the background. I could hear everybody. I remember telling him I just wanted my mom. I said, I, I want my mom. New Bethany Home for Girls in Arcadia, Louisiana, operated from the 1970s through 2001. State officials and law enforcement documented numerous confirmed reports of physical abuse of children who lived in the residential private Christian home. The state conducted two raids at the home in 1988 and 1996, removing children from the campus. But the home was never permanently shut down by state officials or law enforcement. No one at the home, including founder and minister Mac Ford, was ever prosecuted in connection with the abuse. New Bethany finally closed its doors on its own accord in 2001. Since then, women have come forward, claiming they had been raped by Mac Ford while under his care. We weren't taught about a God, a God of love, you know. It was a God of anger and rage and vengeance and it's chucking people into this everlasting lake of fire. He's a pedophile. He's, he's a rapist. He wanted to control everything. They did it through fear. Then the sad part about it is it worked for so many years. Just decades of children just destroyed. And how do you make that better? I don't know if I was asleep. I really don't. I don't know. I just felt his hand up my shirt, on my breast, and I, I wanted to die. Stood pretty close to me and um, asked me if I was a pure lady. I mean, I had no idea what he was talking about. Pushed me down to my knees and unbuttoned his coveralls. He always wore coveralls when he was not up in the pulpit in his silk shirts. I, I can recall every time I've been hit but I can't recall every time I was raped. It, it happened on the compound, it happened in his house, the school, the cafeteria. On the bus, so me in the van, in his car, and he kept telling me, you need this, you need this, I smell, you need this. And I just wish that those people that are sitting out in that congregation, he's preaching hell, fire, and brimstone, would realize he just got through screwing a little girl. Now how do you feel about him? couldn't tell anybody, you know? And even if you did tell anybody, you, they wouldn't believe you. And the, you know, the, the beatings that you received there were so, so horrific that it just was not worth even taking that risk. It haunts me in every, in every way. I never was able to grow up and be the person that I should have been or needed to be or wanted to be. I failed as a mom, a wife, a daughter. I'm sure there's a, a few parents who had good intentions and not realizing, but the bulk of us were throwaways. Maybe a year and nine months or a year doesn't seem a lot, like a long time to people. But at a critical stage of development in a child, brainwashing doesn't take that long. And some part of me believed, a big part of me, like the most important part of me believed I wasn't worth protecting.
Women who attended New Bethany as teenagers found each other online as adults, and they began to share their stories of abuse. A number of these women reunited in Shreveport recently. They came from all over the country in support of Jennifer Halter, who had traveled from Nevada to fulfill her dying wish, to report her claim of sexual assaults that occurred 25 years ago. I mean, we were all there a decade apart from each other. I mean, we were all his victim. The women drove to Arcadia, where Jennifer planned on making her report. However, when they arrived at the Bienville Parish Courthouse, they were first told the case had been handed over to the state police. Wait a minute, we got a report to make. I told him that, and he said, then go to the, you got to go to the state attorney. Let me tell you something, honey. He handed me a piece of paper and escorted me go out. Go ask him again. He escorted me out physically. They, can they oh actually God. deny they can't you deny file me. a police report? Ask them. So they're refusing to take a report? And, and who said this? I don't know. That's what I'm saying. No, I mean, they're who's, asking me. But who's that? Who's the telling? The sheriff. The sheriff. Uh, well, I'm sorry, what was his name? John Ballas. Balance. Balance. She's got all the information. Okay. So this, so don't go to the state, atter state attorney or state police? State police. Okay, and where are they located? <laughs> uh, Upon learning of Jennifer's terminal illness and the distance she traveled, they finally agreed to take her report. Go, Jen. Go, Jen. The next time I come, hopefully it'll be putting him behind bars. Remember the gates when they had the long, the exits that go through? They're still there. I want all of you guys to go with me. If you don't, I'll go by myself. But I gotta do it because my time's running out and I can't, I wanna know if I can let it go. Oh, you know what, God, you brought me that this close and you need to look out for all of us, please. This is the road that I yelled right here. That's the road my mom left me on. I was raped on this compound so many times in so many areas. I always said, I wonder how much we left behind here, besides, of course, our souls. I mean, and there's supposed to be a God out there that is so sacred and so pure. And I love you, God. To take our innocence. Our face. Oh my God! Somebody's down there. It's okay. They're, they can't. They're not gonna hurt. You. I know. That's him standing right there. The blue coveralls. He's coming back. Come on. I don't want to confront. I don't want a confrontation with him. To be real honest, I'm not real hopeful they're going to do anything. I mean, these people are, it's like they're crawling into a hole and hiding from us. You know, they've taken an oath to do their job. In my opinion, they weren't doing it then, and they're not doing it now. Tell us a little bit about conversion therapy. There are different types of therapies that they use, but back in the 80s, when I was a teenager, it was more of the torture and the reparative rape and things like that that were used. Now in the troubled teen industry, they try with different techniques with still physical abuse and just more pray the gay away instead of like when I was there and it was torture the gay away. I know it's hard for you to go back in time. Um, could, you, could you tell us what happened in the cage at New Bethany now? 
keep in mind when when they took him to this conversion therapy, they they threw him in a cage. Uh, James, can you tell us about about that? In the the space where they had the cage, they were chain link, and the there were kids in all of them except for one. And they took me there. They took the padlock off of the the little thing that opens the gate, and then they put me in. And we, they had already told me that their main goal was to break me mentally and spiritually, and that I was not allowed to say one word to anyone unless I was asked. That's awful. Well, I, I did speak to, after they left the room, I did ask the kid in the next cell over, I was like, what is this place? And the words no sooner than they left my lips, the lights brightened, and these three men came tearing into the room. They took my padlock off. They opened the gate. And this man walked in and just started beating me, oh hitting me with this huge Bible. That's awful. I started to fight back. And he yelled at me, no demon, you will not resist. So they thought that this 15-year-old kid that probably weighed 70 pounds, was demon Survivors are here this week to continue the process of educating lawmakers about just how badly children in the troubled teen industry are treated. I'm so grateful that you're all here and I promise you I'm gonna keep fighting. There will be the solitary confinement booth plus a survivor activation. So at the survivor gathering the night before, we'll prep posters similar to what you did. Most of it is just cutie guy. Like meetings, like we did last time, like there's no difference. Okay, so should I just read it out loud? Yeah. I also wanna thank the survivors and family members who are here today, Caroline and Jade, for bravely sharing their experiences with institutional abuse in the hope of making a difference. This is so great because it shows an, another side of Paris. Exactly. Try that. Yeah, let's try yes. these blazers and then we'll try this pant yeah. and then I'll look for a top. Yeah, it's, it's already like fits you really well. Yeah, very professional. Like a sailor. Yeah, it's definitely a sailor <laughs> moment. Yeah, I don't know if that's the right That's, that's like the if right you're going to like a marine point. moment. Yeah. On yeah. the yacht. Um, no. Yeah, no. I'm so proud to be going back to Washington, D.C. This is such an important moment for us all. I'm really excited for this trip, but I also always get nervous anytime I'm doing interviews where it's something that's difficult to talk about and really serious subjects. Off to the ball and what time does this go till? This goes until 11, so we'll be there 9.30 to 11. And then we have our next meeting at 12 at the Capitol. So I'm about to go into the White House. I have a meeting, I'm going to tell my story, so wish me luck. But Hilton is pushing for a federal law to change all of this in the form of a proposed uh, accountability for Congregate Care Act, because she says that this patchwork of legislation state by state is just not doing enough. We just arrived at the Capitol, time for some meetings with senators. Just had another very productive meeting. The day is going amazing, raising so much awareness of the situation. A lot of people are not even aware of everything that's happening. So I'm just so grateful to be here and to tell everyone our story. Oh, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Every day it was torture, just being screamed at, hit. Kids were being sexually abused at night. Um, there was no education and I was terrified for my life. When I found out that this was still happening and even on a bigger level, because now there's thousands of these schools with 120,000 children a year going to these places, I knew that I needed to stand up and use my voice and help put a stop to it. Thank you. It's my vibe, my jam. Oh, I love it. Thank you. Just finished the last meeting of the day. I'm now headed back to the hotel. Gonna be doing an op-ed interview, and then we're gonna be meeting with the survivors. 
So, it's been a long day, the day's not over, but we are gonna keep fighting this fight. Back at the Conrad, about to go downstairs to go meet the survivors. I just wanna say thank you all so much for coming here to DC for this. This is, I'm in tears, I'm very emotional just seeing everyone in the room and it means so much to me, to other people who are trapped in these places right now and I'm just so proud of all of us. I went to five facilities over three years and didn't talk about it for a decade. And then right when your documentary came out, someone interviewed me and my friend about our program and we got it closed down. It took me, what, 10 years to find you? <laughs> it took yeah. me 20 years to find this. I mean, it really was all because of you. You really ripped the Band-Aid off. None of us deserved what we were put through. We're not the ones who should be ashamed. It's the people who work at and run these places. Yeah. I just, I love you all and I'm so grateful that you're all here and I promise you I'm gonna keep fighting. Tomorrow's gonna be a very busy day, so I'll try to get some rest. I have to wake up in a couple hours. I'm gonna do this. Hey guys, we are here in front of the Capitol. We have made an installation of a solitary confinement booth. I wanted people to come and experience and see how it feels to be in one of these. Children are locked in these every single day. We'll be here from 10 to 11 a.m. That felt so weird, like when he closed and locked the door, I, I literally know, started I was, crying. I was worried for you. I literally had like a flashback. <laughs> Trying to hold back the tears because this is a really important day and directly after this we have a press conference, so I am trying to be as strong and brave as possible. I know that many of the people who are here right now have spent days, if not weeks, locked in a room like that. So these type of, of memories and experiences will stay with you forever. You're so beautiful. And inside and out, I love you. I love you. Thank you. So, I'm so sorry. You made this happen. You made this, I've waited nine years, long years. And I tried to advocate by myself. I got nowhere until the group, Alyssa brought me to the group. I'm so happy you're here and I wish that he could be here with us today, but I know that he's looking down and knowing we're thinking of him. He is. It makes me mad that I didn't scream louder because I can't believe all these people are still going through it. 40 years later. Mm -hmm. It is 40 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why didn't I speak up? And I'm scared. I thought they'd come back and get me again. I know. Oh, no. I have nightmares every night. Me too. <laughs> I, I, I understand you. I am. Bless you. Survivors are here this week to continue the process of educating lawmakers about just how badly children in the troubled teen industry are treated. Our job is to raise awareness by sharing our experiences with abuse, neglect, and even death of a loved one. Our legislators' job is to enact policy that addresses the solution. I don't believe there is such a thing as inaction. We will work for broad bipartisan support of the Stop Institutional Child Abuse Act to make sure it passes and becomes law. We are not playing politics with children's lives. I'm hopeful once you hear these stories that you cannot unhear them. We will not give up. There needs to be greater protections for our children in institutional care settings. Our children deserve it. Brandon deserves it. And our voices will never be silenced. People need to know this is happening now. Yeah. It's not what, just like back when I was a teenager, this is now. I'm so glad we're doing this in front of Congress as well, too, mm -hmm. so they could like so they know we're serious. Whenever I was in there, whenever we talk, I, oh my gosh, we'd be like, oh Paris, that's our PCS queen, like, we love her. <laughs> and when you, when you did the, um, the, when you came to the protest yes, stuff, I wasn't there, but I was told what happened. The kids heard you. They, they saw, saw us? Yeah, they saw oh you. God. That's why they put gla uh, the, pex the plexi stuff on the glass, so yeah. we can't see out. Yeah, we weren't allowed to look out the window, so I was like, I hope they can see that we're out yeah, here fighting for them. The way they treat people with depression or autism like me, and you know, the restraints, like, I was underweight. It did not take, like, four guys t to tackle me and slam my head into the ground. Thank you for coming and being strong. Thank you so Thank much, Miss Paris. I'm from Bethesda in the 80s, and nobody listened to me until you came around. Thank you, ma'am. It's my pleasure. When I was 16 years old, I was taken in the middle of the night by two large men. I had no idea who they were. I thought I was being kidnapped and they held up handcuffs. 
and said, do you want to go the easy way or the hard way? And I found out later that's what they call the transport system, and it's one of the ways so that the parents don't see the facilities where they're dropping off their children. It was like a living nightmare, just every day, being screamed at, yelled at, silenced, not allowed to speak, literally putting us on chairs, staring against a wall, and if you even got tired or just slumped your shoulders down for one minute, they would immediately come and hit you in the back of the head and start your time all over again. And I probably spent six months staring at a wall. I had no education. These are basic human rights. The right to not be abused, the right to be able to speak to your family, the right to be able to not be sedated and restrained. We just finished our last meeting at the Capitol. Today was such an impactful day. I'm so proud and so excited. I feel like we're really gonna make some huge changes. So now we're on our way to the White House. We're gonna be doing a candlelight vigil outside. We're gathered here in front of the White House tonight to remember those who been lost to this industry that has harmed so many families. It was hard for me to believe that a 14-year-old teenage girl that needed help would die in the hands of somebody else. That you think that when you place your child, when you need help and you need services for them, that they would help. The last thing he said to me, the last time I saw him, he tried to speak and he said, I want <laughs> I want, and then finally it came out, love. You know, justice for Naomi, I saw her at McDonald's, I said goodbye. The next time I saw her, she was at a funeral home, um, dead. We brought her home in a backpack, cremated. And that's how we brought her home from that facility. Since then, we found out lots of information that is just absolutely wrong. And this bill that we're all here to support Changes that need to be made need to happen so that we can have a safer place for kids to go. I can't imagine Naomi being at that place for only a few weeks and this happening. It's just. Day three of DC. Another day, another slay. How are things going? Things are going amazing. I feel that people are really understanding just how serious of an issue this is. Hello. Nice to see you nice again. Nice to see you again. Pleasure. Thanks for being here. Yes. And I hear you may have a bipartisan bill now, right? Yes. That's good. OK, we'll try to help you in any way we can. I'm all for the proposal. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So that would mean the world it. to it's me. It's a good bill. It's thank good you. Bill. Thank you so and much. And you were subject to this abuse yourself. Two years of my life lost. The majority leader just committed to helping us pass this through Senate. I am so thrilled. Without no. your leadership, people like me wouldn't know. No, that, no one would know. How you could know? you think that this is happening? It's exactly definitely very personal to me, and I feel that turning pain into purpose is the most powerful thing that I can do. It was, it was just a lot of torture tactics. There was no education whatsoever. Thank you for caring and having a big heart. Oh, absolutely. That's why we're here. Thank you. How? Look, he's swimming. Yes. <laughs> and the legislation you got, that's hot. <laughs> Been an advocate all day, and now I am putting on one of my other hats, which is DJing. So I'm going to be performing tonight for the survivors a lot of the staff members from Congress and senators and uh, this is a very early DJ set at 8 o'clock at night. I'm used to playing later at night but definitely a lot more chill than it would be in Ibiza or Las Vegas at one of my normal sets. But let's do it DC. Hi guys. See you in a minute. I'm gonna go check and make sure the sound check is working. Everyone looks amazing. I love the kitty ears. Yes, Queen.
fourth day on Capitol Hill. It's been a long week. I think you moved the needle this oh, week. Oh yeah, it's been yeah. really, really amazing week. Well, for me, I'm really just turning my pain into a purpose and I believe maybe God maybe go through this and gave me this gift and this platform so one day I could be the hero that I always needed. I just feel that these places need to be held accountable. They need to know they're being watched. If I can make a change to this, it will make it all worth it. Thank you for giving voice to this. There's a lot of kids who, who need you. They really do, and thank you for fighting for the same cause. So we just finished our last meeting of the day at the Capitol. It's been an incredible four days, so impactful. I feel that everyone is really understanding the seriousness of this and I am just thrilled with how every meeting went. As I said, I will not stop fighting until change is made, and I will be back. Remember, it is open today. They are still abusing boys, and we need to put a stop to this immediately. If you have a 1% chance that this could happen to your child, why would you even take that risk? My name is Janine Miller, and you are watching Pieces of Anger. they can still criminally charge their abuser and you're refusing to take like you're literally making these kids who were raped not have any form of justice because you think it's going to be too hard to prove when we literally have other kids that witnessed what happened to that kid that's just outlandish i mean to make those judgment calls um who cares what your opinion is you need to just take the report Somebody needs to do their job. I was gonna, going to say something to you, Amanda. I understand that you had witnessed boys being beat in, in the padded room, coming out bloodied. So you've witnessed how traumatizing this place is, correct? Yeah, I've only witnessed a few. Like the first, the first student I ever watched get restrained, um, is someone we all know within our community. And it was interesting because like I knew that they were being restrained and I didn't hear, I didn't know who it was until they told me, oh, I was restrained September, uh, I think it was like September 12th, 2001, right after the Twin Towers fall. And I remembered that. I was like, oh my gosh, I remember having to run out because at that time into when the Twin Tower, we were all, the staff, the boys, we were all in the dining hall watching the news footage, hanging out together all by the dining hall. And so like, I remember being forced to leave the dining hall when that was happening. Um, and then there was another kid who got drug up there and then uh, we had to leave while he was being drug up there. But when we were finishing dinner, he was coming down from the padded palace and he had like bloody marks on his face and arm, like elbows were all bruised up. Oh my God, that's awful. And just to clarify the background of Agape, your father was staff at Agape. You're at this point in time, you're living at Agape. Is that correct? Yes, okay. that is correct. I do not think it would have been as sadistic as Circle of Hope was if it weren't for the fact that we went to Agape. I think my dad literally learned all of the extreme abuses abusive tactics from Agape. And I do not think Circle of Hope would have been like that. But because we went to Agape, 
he learned how to do it. And that says it in a nutshell right there, that's agape. Agape is that horrifying. And they close the circle of hope. Now you're taking the root of the problem, which is agape, and now you're tossing it into the circle of hope girls ranch. They actually had closed down for the audience that doesn't know. My parents have not been prosecuted. My pr parents are out on bond right now. They're free. They are on house arrest. Uh, we're still waiting the trial. My parents were let out on a thousand dollars. Okay, Chanel, do you want to tell us a, a little bit of detail of maybe one incident that happened to you that you needed medical treatment and they wouldn't care for you? Um, so um, I had um, torn ligaments in my knees. So uh, I was uh, in the back with the horses. I was in lower co color shirt color. The higher shirt color was telling me to go inside this pen. It was storming. And I knew it, I shouldn't have gone inside this pen because this horse was scared, like you scared the thunder and everything. But she said that I'd have to do it or I'd get push-ups. So I was just like, okay, fuck it, I'm just going to do it. So I went in there, grabbed hold of the horse strider, fell back because he reared. I fell back and then um, my had torn ligaments in my knees. My knees swelled up like a oh huge balloon. And... Um, they did take me to the hospital because they thought I'd broken it. That's what they like honestly thought because he had to come and get the truck to come in. I was screaming in the pouring rain and everything. It was bloody sore. Um, and the doctor said I needed to rest on my um, knee for like, I think it was like a couple of weeks. I had to rest on my knee. I think I had like two days, I think it was. They rested and they told me I'd to start working again. And then ever since then, every time my knee like, I did uh, um, I did my knee in, like it started swelling up again. I still had to work because they knew it wasn't broken. They said you can still work on it. It's awful. And I remember you saying that during your interview, and that's just horrifying. Yeah. Terrible. Sorry that you had to go through that. But that's just I still get damaged. I've still got damaged cult. knees now to this day. Still damaged. That's awful. And that's just the culture in these places. They're not giving these kids any medical attention. There was a case where two girls um, were working out in the snow and one of them got frostbite and they yeah. didn't even take her to go get medical attention. And worse, they made her go out in the snow and continue working. Yeah, I was there for that. And that's one of the stories I'm pulling from is one of your stories. That's awful. But while we have Colton and you bring up how long it took uh, for Circle of Hope to get closed, especially since the girls had been speaking out on it for years, Parents had filed reports. There was the 2018 sexual trafficking report by the Highway Patrol. And remember, when the video came out in March, they sent this video to all of these authorities, and they didn't think the video mattered because he didn't hit anyone. He just told the girls oh, to geez. knock her out. So it wasn't the video in itself. It was, you know, going on all the Survivor podcasts, including yours. It was working with NBC. Thank you, Tyler Kincaid. He's an ethical journalist. We highly recommend him. He continued. He did the Agape story as well. And then really what was the hammer after the Casey star got Carrie Ingalls attention was all of y'all, Colton, Janine, everyone from across the country descending on this tiny town in Missouri and forcing both the legislators to actually write something, which they did within five days. They promised us within five days of us being there, like we heard you guys. And within 72 hours of us descending on this tiny town, the governor escalated Circle of Hope to the attorney general. And that's how we worked that. That's what we wanted with Agape too. I'm personally really fucking fed up with the fact that the internet and the entire communities, advocates and allies and survivors are gonna go ape shit when they finally get that these girls are being abused in these ways at these programs. But then when they hear that autistic boys are being gang raped at these programs by these Christian pastor men in this good old boy, gays need not apply society, that where where is the outrage with that? And I think that I would love to hear Colton's opinion because I can't imagine as a man being so frustrated. There, I've heard multiple guys suggest that nobody cares about boys. They don't. They don't care if they beat them. They don't care what they do to them. And now they don't care if they rape them. Like, how do I mean, how are our brothers feeling? Like, how do we even support them right now? Like, you know, Colton, I consider Colton a huge leader as a male in this community. And so I would just love to hear his thoughts on this. 
Colton? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, it brings a good point. So when you, in, in my personal opinion, based off what I've seen over my short life, when when boys or men complain about something or bring something to attention, they don't tend to take it as serious, right? Because well, why were these you know teenage boys in this trouble teen industry and trouble teen school anyways? Probably because they were out doing bad things. And so they, they tend to not be as compassionate, in my opinion, which sucks because uh, abuse is abuse regardless if it's a boy or a girl, right? It should be taken the same, especially from a kid. Uh, but, I mean, it's true, though. I mean, it's just how it goes, you know. It's one of those things we've been used to for so long, like, oh, we're just boys, nobody really cares about us, which that's not necessarily the truth, right? There's a lot of people that actually do care, just not when it matters, like everybody wants to, oh, you know, yeah, these kids are getting abused, and you know, I'll say Circle of Hope, they come out, and everybody's on board. Which thankfully everybody was on board because we needed to shut that down, right? But then they hear about Agape, and it's like, well, I don't know, they're boys, which maybe that's not accurate, but that's just how it comes off. But now we have an autistic 13-year-old boy. Well, I, I mean, know. what could possibly this poor autistic boy have done? And he's thrown well, into this reform I, school. They don't want him anymore. They don't want him anymore. Right out. And so but, what, what I'm saying is now the media is looking at, a, okay, you don't care about boys that are getting in trouble, right? You don't care about that. But now you have a 13-year-old autistic boy, and still nothing is being done. Are you really driving? Shh. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that light was not good to me. <laughs> I'll go ahead and edit that out. But <laughs> it does look cute. Don't <laughs> leave it and have it as your promo. Just oh my it. god! Before the episode comes out, be like, you're I hung out with you're trouble. You're even bouncing, so it looks like you're in a toy car. What is a toy car? <laughs> Oh my God, that's hilarious.